Hello, and welcome to the 1840 Podcast, where each month we explore a different topic balancing modern sensibilities with traditional sensitivities to give you new approaches to timeless Jewish ideas. I'm your host, David Beshevkin, and this month we're exploring books, books, books. Thank you so much to our series sponsor, an old friend who chooses to remain anonymous. This podcast is part of a larger exploration of those big, juicy Jewish ideas, so be sure to check out 1840.org, where you can also find videos, articles, and recommended readings. First, I need to thank our episode sponsor. Uh, it's something new. We, we usually don't have corporate sponsorships. We usually have people, listeners, who dedicate episodes, but we welcome all sorts of sponsorships. It really helps us do what we're doing. And our uh, episode sponsor actually comes from an old friend who I worked with many, many years ago uh, in out Jewish outreach together in Birthright. Uh, really special. And he built an incredible company that I know personally called Twillery, which is spelled T W I L L O R Y dot com. T W I L L O R Y dot com. Twillery dot com that has amazing stuff. I personally am a huge fan of their joggers, their sports jacket. I wear it all the time. Have a bunch of their uh, shirts, which are all uh, absolutely fantastic and special to our listeners. Uh, you can get $18 off of all orders, more than $139. Uh, just use the coupon code 184018FORTY when you check out. Uh, they do great work. Uh, it's a really special company. If you're looking for some great shirts, great joggers, great sports jackets, or all the other kind of swag to uh, make yourself look dapper as ever as you are reading uh, your books outside on the porch or uh, wherever you're vacationing or late at night, just relaxing. Uh, again, twillery.com. Uh, use the coupon code 1840. And we are so grateful uh, for their sponsorship of the episode. This is a special July 4th uh, episode. We always do books, books, books over the summer, and there are different forms of books, different types of books. And the reason why this episode is a little bit unusual is because we have two separate interviews in one episode. It had to do a little bit with scheduling. I wasn't sure if uh, one of the guests, my dear friend Alex Edelman, I would be able to schedule it properly. Uh, but we're grouping them together, and as you will hear on the uh, in on the conversation with Alex. He's actually uh, Chavrusas. He learns together with Sarah Hurwitz. I know them both really, really well. And they both represent something, to me at least, which is so important. I've written about it. I've spoken about it. And that is building kind of entryways into Jewish identity, Jewish thought that are rigorous, substantive, but are able to reach people who maybe aren't centrally located within the Orthodox community within the Jewish community and building what I like to call neon entry signs. I wrote an article many years ago for Jewish action that I'm still, uh, I'm very proud of it. I think I wrote it uh, maybe five, five or so years ago. It's called Failure Goes to Yeshiva, What I've Learned from the Failure Narratives of My Students. Uh, I teach a class in Yeshiva University. One of the, I teach many classes. One of the classes I teach is on religious crisis on rebuilding your own religious identity. And I ended the article as follows, and it's something I come back to over and over again, not just in the context of 1840, when I'm visiting, when I'm speaking to people, when I'm thinking about how to construct our community. And I conclude the article on the following note. I write, for fire safety, most buildings require neon exit signs. Our communal institutions need brighter entrance signs. And as we develop more classroom, schools, shuls, and even podcasts, I hope our entrances continue to outshine our exits. You can look up in any room, in any office building, you always have those neon exit signs. And I think sometimes in our community, unfortunately, there are too many neon exit signs where people, they have reasons to leave and not enough reasons to stay. And we need neon entrance signs, creative ways to build entry points for people to engage in Jewish life in rigorous ways and thoughtful ways and self-reflective ways. I think the model of this, you know, many, many years ago, uh, but it's a classic, and it's everything that we're talking about today is building new doorways to engage in Jewish life, is the book first published in 1959, This Is My God by Herman Wouk, 
I think I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but send in letters. I got so many letters after attempting to pronounce Jorge Borges. Did I do it better this time? I emphasize the S. Uh, people were outraged. Uh, so I'm always hesitant to uh, pronounce people's last names. Wook is a tricky one. W-O-U-K. Uh, he wrote a book called This Is My God in 1959. Uh, he was a, uh, obviously, not obviously, but at the time, quite obviously, really like a celebrity. He had won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for the book The Cane Mutiny, which had come out eight years earlier in 1951, where there were movies that were based on his books and really was like a titan. And it was like really fascinating to see somebody in the public square engage so openly with their own Jewish identity. There is one quote that always, always sticks with me. It's such a powerful quote. And I just want to give a shout out to Herman Wook. I don't want to say we've abandoned him, but I think we may have forgotten about him or we don't remember him enough. Let me call it like that. We don't remember him enough and how important, again, he died in 2019. He was over 100. He was 103, I believe. And his book, This Is My God, which again, it's been a while since I read it. I can't sign off on any passage. I I don't sign off on any passage of any book that I necessarily uh, recommend. But as a neon entrance sign for what was going on in the time in the late 1950s of having people come and say, wow, Herman Wook, this person won a Pulitzer Prize. There are movies based on his books, and he's engaging so publicly with Jewish identity. I believe in that. I believe we need more of that. Uh, We sometimes are willing to rest on our laurels of the core of our community that we've built over the last uh, half a century or so, which is frankly incredible, the level of education that we've spoken about. But there are so many who, they don't have an entryway. The core of our community, the core of the Orthodox community, particularly in America, sometimes it's hard to get in. The language is hard for a lot of people to even understand a basic class. They go on to any of the websites, even to understand the the very basics, it it could be hard to have an entry point. And we need more neon entrance signs for people to really reflect and engage in their Jewish life. And this is a quote from Herman Wook that always stayed with me. It's so powerful. He writes that religious people tend to encounter among those who are not a cemented certainty that belief in God is a crutch for the weak and the fearful. Now, the belief in God may turn out to be the last trump to be a mistake. Meanwhile, let us be quite clear. It is not merely the comfort of the simple, though it is that too, much to its glory. It is a formidable intellectual position with which most of the first class minds of the human race, century in and century out, have concurred each in his own way. Speaking of crutches, and and this is powerful, he really says it, Freud can be a crutch, Marx can be a crutch, rationalism can be a crutch, and atheism can be two canes and a pair of iron braces. We none of us have all the answers, nor are we likely to have. But in the country of the halt, the man who is surest, he has no limp, may be the worst crippled. It's an incredible uh, making a case for rigorous Jewish life, Jewish identity, Jewish thought, Jewish learning, and people who are making that case each in their own way. I'm not comparing any of our guests today, but I do look at all of these as neon entry signs. They may not be the way that the center of our community uh, engages primarily in thinking about their Jewish life, but we have to have appreciation. I I think we should have appreciation. And we also should know what entry points we have. All of us have family. We have friends who are looking for entry points into Jewish life. I don't know how many times I've been asked, like, hey, somebody in my life wants to know more about Judaism. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's uh, somebody who you know tangentially, a neighbor, whatever it is. And it's sad, right? As I said, neighbor, I think part of what has shaped our community is that it's become more and more rare, particularly in the tri-state area, to even have a neighbor who is not a part of the kind of central, highly educated Jewish community. That's another thing. We just need to be aware of how much has changed and how important it is to remind ourselves of these neon entrance signs that we build into Jewish life and Jewish learning in rigorous ways And those entry signs, especially in the generation that we live, uh, should be creative, should be thoughtful. Uh, It's not always going to work to just take something written in the same language because it's in English and say, try try this. It needs to reflect some of the sensitivities and sensibilities of people who were not raised um, 
centrally within the Jewish world. And that's why I'm excited about both of these conversations. And I'm excited that we're having them both. We're juxtaposing them next to each other. They're two very different perspectives, but two people who I believe have really dedicated their careers in in creative ways to bringing the joy of rigorous Jewish learning out to the masses. These are people who have profiles that exist far beyond, you know, a, a niche part of the Jewish community. Um, one, Sarah, who I know, who I met at a Jewish Week conference that they used to run many, many years ago. And I met her along with my cousin, Alti Carper, and it's also where I happen to have met Shalom Dean, and we all kind of hit it off from very different vantage points. You know, I'm from, I'm a Long Island yeshiva uh, educated Jew. Alti's a Lower East Side. We've had her as a guest uh, editor at Shakin. Shalom grew up in New Square and later left the Hasidic community. And Sarah uh, grew up, as you'll hear, um, definitely not in the centrally located Jewish community. And she worked in the White House as a speechwriter. She was a speechwriter for Michelle Obama. Uh, really at the higher echelons of political power. And what was her move after the White House? She wrote a book on Judaism. And we actually have mutual friends, a fellow uh, podcaster, but I really know him as a friend before he was podcasting, even a mentor of sorts, David Lichtenstein. I was one time at his house for Shabbos. Uh, and and I, I wish I could go back there. David, if you're listening or any of uh, your friends are listening, God willing, we'll make it happen again. Uh, but I used to go there quite frequently with my with my dear dear friend uh, Maishi, and I remember one of the, the last time that I was there. I don't even think Maishi was there. I was just there with my my wife and family, and he said we were talking about who who else has been around this Shabbos table. It's kind of like this epic pilgrimage. It's a very special Shabbos table. Always questions, conversation, debate. And he said, "Ah, oh, we had Sarah Hurwitz last week," and I was like, "Sarah Hurwitz?" Like <laughs> it was just such a crossing, you know. Is it, it, to, to imagine it in Shabbos table, she's not a part of the community where David lives, uh, but it was it was charming. One of the most curious, rigorous, thoughtful Jews that I've ever met. And she happens to learn with another friend who I've never interacted with them together, uh, my now friend Alex Edelman. Alex was on the podcast two years ago for our uh, Purim episode. He has a show called Just For Us. Uh, which was a one-man show that is now debuting on Broadway, which is a very big deal. Anytime I open up Facebook and I'm walking the street, I see billboards, ads for it all the time. Uh, he is an incredibly gifted comedian who was raised kind of centrally within the modern Orthodox community, uh, but now he's on a very different stage and in a very you know in a different place in his life. But it still very much informs who he is and what he shares. And I spoke to both of them about their writing process. They both write in different ways. Alex writes uh, shows. Sarah is a speechwriter. But we spoke about the process of writing and the role that Jewish identity plays in their life. Uh, I found the conversation absolutely illuminating. I hope you do as well. So without further ado, our first conversation with my friend Alex Edelman. I appreciate the time you took to uh, to speak together. It does mean a lot to me. And you have a show that is debuting on Broadway. And we're covering this month books, 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 which is really talking about books, writing, creative output. We're talking to different forms of artists. And I guess I wanted to start with your process, not of getting the show on Broadway, but what does your writing process look like to originally create this show? Did you write out the entire script for the show word for word? Do you have sitting somewhere like an actual script? No. Does it vary from night to night? What, no. What's the process like? No. <laughs> no. That's not how I work. I work Chavrusa style. That's how I write. I write with a someone I sit and argue with, and that's how I do it. Who, who is your Chavrusa for this? Well, my Chavrusa is a lovely guy named Adam Brace who died about six weeks ago, actually. It's been a very tough it's been very tough um but but he was uh my closest friend and um and but you know and obviously i'm devastated but there are other like rabigli is a comedian who is really good about that um but even audiences i mean like comedy is a process of of refining comedy is 10 percent writing than 
how many is ten percent writing and then ninety percent editing? That's how it works. So I write an idea as sort of like a bullet point. God, I wish I had one of my notebooks near me. But I write an idea as a bullet point and hold on, I'll share my screen. How's that? Yeah, please. This is a joke that I'm working on about how I don't know how much money costs in old movies. Whenever they're like, that'll be $9 in a black and white movie. I'm like, is that enough for a horse? Is it enough for a house? (laughs) Is it enough for dinner? Is it enough for one bar of candy? Like, I don't know. Is it a box of milk duds? Is Is it a single dud? So it's just an idea. It will most likely be nothing because, I mean, how many pages are in this master list? One second. Oh my God, there are 86 pages of bullet points. Oh, wow. That is quite. And you're scrolling through now. I'm watching you do this. I see some bold words jumping out at me. But yeah, I can't really read the jokes. But I see this is a, this is a lot of free form eye contact at Chipotle. That's what I see right there. Yeah, you make eye, eye contact at Chipotle. Oh, this is, a, this is not a joke. It's a recommendation. Someone said you're sad. You should listen to Anderson Cooper talk to Stephen Colbert. Um, uh,. Oh, this is my, I said to my mom, you know what the number one place to go before you die is? And she went, a hospital. And I was like, <laughs> you know, and it was just a line, but I jot it down because it is funny, right? Like it is a, a funny thing. And then it, like these ideas, sometimes they're thoughts that, you know, a friend of mine was in a UFC fight and he won in the first minute. And, uh, you know, we took a long time to get to the fight. And so basically... Um, there was some disappointment that your friend won so quickly. Yes, we sat in traffic for we were for an hour, and he was in trouble for thirty eight seconds. And how we should get all of our money back? Th- this isn't why you're showing me this document, and I-, I hope you won't begrudge me for noticing. But I can't help but be somewhat moved that I see number one, Safaria Shabbos thirty one A is a tab that seems to be either be in your recent history or open, and you have something from. Chabad.org Why two versions? I don't know what is this. Why two versions of the Ten Commandments? That's like literally on your screen. I don't know what you've been up to if that's part of the show. It's not Uh, part it's not part of the show, but it is yeah, but I mean like look, I have my interests and my interests are are diffuse, but some of them there are other interests in that bookmark bar, but yeah, I uh I do use Safari. Uh, your your listeners will be familiar with Safari, obviously, right? Very much so. A part of this series is we are speaking to the founder of Safari, Josh Foer, uh, who's uh, really, really a, a hero of the Jewish people. He's done a lot of incredible work. I just did a class at Lair House, which is this tavern in sure, uh, Boston. Boston. I just love Josh. I think he's the type of visionary leadership that we need to sort of like advance Jewish learning and advance Jewish thought. And look, the reason I want to do your podcast again. Yeah. Why did you want to do my podcast? You're a busy guy. Because the people that come up to me to tell me that they know me from your podcast are orthodox people with open minds. And it doesn't mean that they're, you know, it doesn't mean that they don't have standards or they're not rigorous or that even I agree with them on everything. But I, I think we need... I, I said to you last time on the podcast, I worry about um, that the more traditional elements of Judaism have abandoned inclusion to the more liberal elements of Judaism. And I worry that the more liberal elements of Judaism or reinventive elements of Judaism have abandoned rigorousness to the more traditional elements of Judaism. And I like the idea that you live in a world where you try to have both like everything. I don't say this in most of my interviews, but all of the things that I try to do somehow can be traced back to the sort of modern orthodoxy where like my comedy is traditional, but hopefully reinventive, right? I have a, my jokes are familiar to those who love jokes in terms of their aesthetic and structure. Sure. Also they're personal or there's a, there's a bent that marks them as distinct from a, you know, Henny Youngman bit or a Jackie Mason joke. And they take a lot of time to make and they're very hard to make and they require lots of feedback and twitch and tweaking and, and they don't always work. Uh, but I, I think that approach to, to, to modern orthodoxy, to interrogating what it is and not just going, this is, 
this is the world. This is how we uh, live in it, no matter what the world throws at us. But also having a little shred of like, okay, I exist in the world. I'm an Orthodox Jew. It means so much to me. How does that synthesize with modern society? How do I find the biting point between distinct identity and assimilation in a way that doesn't in a way that fully services both things. And so I noticed that a lot of the people that I was having conversations with who had come up to me because they heard me on the podcast, I went, those are the type of people I want coming to my shows. Those are the type of people that I want opening restaurants in Somerville or, you know, or spending more time with because I want, like my circle of people are, you know, Jews, artists, social workers think like people who think deeply about the relationship that uh that they have to their communities and the in the you know in their greater communities writ large so so yeah it's a very academic answer but like i really but whenever anyone comes up to me and says i know you from from 1840 i'm like oh that's a this is gonna be a good conversation where <laughs> we have some stuff in common so I, I, I want to ask you about that because you know you, you're about to go on to broadway and you had this one-man show that really kind of blew up your profile. You had been on TV before. You'd been involved in entertainment. I'm curious what your relationship is to uh, to fame in general. Uh, you're probably more recognizable now. You have people walking up to you on the street. And I'm curious what role fame plays in your creative process, meaning aside from how you cope with it and deal with it on a personal level, how does it deal with your creative process? Does it add another level of pressure to you? Does it make it less fun and enjoyable because the expectations are higher? What role does fame play kind of on a personal level and the creative level? I'm not famous yet, David. Like, it's really sweet, but I'm not famous you, yet. You, you don't get stopped on the street when you I, walk? That's not famous. You get recognized, being recognized and being famous aren't the same. You know, I, I like, I like not being famous. I am appreciated by some people, which I, which I in turn appreciate myself. Like I love being appreciated, but no, I'm not famous, which is really famous. Fame seems absolutely terrible. Fame seems like a really difficult, um, bitter pill to swallow. Why? What do you think about it? it? Seems so terrible. It's extremely depersonalizing, and it is the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Sometimes hardly seem worth it. I see a lot of people go through the depersonalizing aspects of fame, and it is a. I think it's really difficult, and people who are famous, I don't think, are any are more or less happy than people who aren't. I've noticed but that. You, but you don't feel like, again, like any creative output has some element that is like a little depersonalizing. Like on your show, so I, I don't know I don't know that I wanted to even get into this and we never Go spoke ahead, go about, ahead. We never spoke about the details. I, I I know there was an incident at one of your shows once. I don't know if it was hecklers and people who were coming from specifically the more traditional lines of the community. And somebody told me, they said it was upsetting. And I'm curious, like, to me, the only way to be successful, especially, again, not, not, not an overt hecklers, but with people who are going to be critical and feedback, you have to depersonalize yourself a little bit from what you're creating, no? No. I mean, maybe with, like, a movie or a book. Uh but I'm just telling a story, you know, I'm just telling a story to people and, and it's, it's reached a nice amount of height, but, um, I remember that guy. I remember that guy who came, who thought that I was, um, you know, he thought I was making fun of, uh, of Judaism. And, uh, I was because I love it so much. And (laughs) guilty. you know, he said to me, what are you, he said, what are some good things about Judaism? This guy from the back yells, what are some good things about Judaism? And I said to him, if you play your cards right, you get to compose and perform a 90 minute love letter to it every night on stage. That's a nice answer. It's true. It's how I, it's, it's, it's how I feel. And, um, and then he tried to keep talking to me actually. And I was like, no, no. I said, I'll talk to you after the show. And I spoke to him after the show. He was drunk. Um, but it was a night where people are able to understand. Uh, also, 
not to play this card, but I've had questions internally about it. Like, oh, is it okay that I'm up here? I'm like, you know, Rabbi Lookstein came and wrote me like a lovely letter afterwards. I'm like, if Rabbi, if Rabbi Lookstein comes to your show and thinks it's if Rabbi Buckdahl from Central Synagogue and Rabbi Cosgrove and all, like all these people have had really wonderful. Is it, is the right word yichus? No, it's the no. The, these people have either they're they're they're, they're be, Rabbi Luxi's yichus for sure. Yeah, That's I the mean, right word. I mean, like I just think it's a really wonderful, uh, and Jews more than anything else, they feel seen by it, which is really which is the greatest joy of the whole thing for me as a Jew as a Jewish person. That Jews, by and large, there's some Jews who don't agree with it entirely. Are you getting people who are coming to your shows who are like, I, I want to learn more about what it means to be Jewish? Like, do you have a follow up conversation or have you had follow ups where people are like, where, where can I actually find more? Not in the sense of a comedy, but like for many people, you are the entry point to their reflection on Jewish identity. I'm curious if somebody approaches you or, or has approached you, Jewish or non-Jewish, where do you take them after your show? You know, um, I mean, my show's not like meant to be Kirov, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like it's not meant to be outreach, but uh, I appreciate if it's, and, and it's free to be encountered that way. There's no like, I'm not like, you should visit a Chabad, but like people want to, people want to talk to me about their Judaism or their experience with Judaism. I always listen. But if people come up to me, I've had people come up to me and go, you know, I'm interested in learning more about Judaism. And sometimes I'm like, have you heard of Bereshit? <laughs> you know, have you heard of the book of <laughs> Genesis? Um, there are resources. And sometimes I post them. Sfaria is fantastic for people. I think there are a lot of great entry points for people looking to, to find out about Judaism. When people ask me for resources in terms of the things that I'm talking about, about how Jews feel about existing, I refer them to Dara Horn's book, People Love Dead Jews. Part of this series, too. Because it's written with the sort of mordant humor that I think is exactly what we need. And she writes great jokes. And by the way, if you speak to Dara, she'll be like, they're not jokes. They're just points. <laughs> Sarah Hurwitz wrote a great book on Jewish spirituality called Here All Along, which I... I can't tell if... Do you know what our series is? Like, do you, did somebody tip you off? No. Our series is Josh Fower, Sarah Hurwitz, Dara Horn, and... and, and uh, David Baddiel? And- no, no, David Mazeal is not a part of this of this series, but but he has also a great book on this, and that was an, a fantastic I, guess. I mean, Sarah Hurwitz is my chavrusa. Sarah Hurwitz and I um, sometimes Zoom and discuss the Parsha uh, that week, or we'll discuss something a little more uh, in depth. But yeah, Sarah is one of my closest friends, and in the pandemic, we started this chavrusa, and we spent some time together in D.C. when I was there, and she's a lovely, thoughtful I, I I don't like using the word genius, but she might be up there. You may have a couple of geniuses um, in, in this series. Josh was unmistakably one. Yeah, and he's not subtle about his genius. It's, it, it, it shines through. He's yeah. really, really incredible. No, but it's hard to find. Jewish books are hard. And not, yes. And not. I don't enjoy many of them. Frankly. Making them accessible. What do you think? For me, it's it's sometimes being inclusive and accessible. You have to trade off exactly what you said on the rigorousness and the substance. And then when it's rigorous and substantive, it's just not accessible. Like it's it's for it's for ten people. It's for a hundred people. It's hard. It's the hardest part. What is your and I want to come back to the show because I have some specific questions. I'm curious, what is in your pantheon of of Jewish books? Nathan Englander's short story collection for the relief of unbearable urges. Um, that's up there. Anything by Edgar Carrot is very special. I'm, not, I'm embarrassed. I, I don't even know who that is. Nathan Englander or Edgar Carrot? Edgar Carrot. Edgar Carrot's an Israeli short story writer. I tend to prefer Israeli fiction. Um, hold on, let me walk us over to my bookshelf. We have a lovely apartment, might I add. Thank you. Stop editorializing the appearances. <laughs> um, what's up here? Menachem Begin's White Knights is up here. Signed, by the way. Founded in a used bookstore. God, there's quite a few. So are we talking fiction? Or are we talking nonfiction? The non, let's say, canonical books that have informed your Jewish identity. Gosh, okay. I mean, 
Just for our listeners, Alex is literally uh, crouched on the floor by his bookshelf doing what exactly what I asked him to do, which I really do appreciate. Lonely Man of Faith is up here, of course. The Rev. Joseph Soloveitchik's Lonely Man of Faith. God in Search of Man is somewhere here, obviously. I mean, that's those are I canonical, saw- aren't, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. They're modern. They're part of the modern canon. Let's call it. Yeah, those are part of the. Uh, those are part of the the modern canon. I can't believe. Um, yeah, Englander's book is great. Suddenly, a knock on the door, which is the my favorite of the Edgar Carrot books, and that's been translated. Edgar Carrot. Yeah, I assume. By the way, it's been translated by Nathan by Nathan Englander, who is um, the work of Darren Strauss means a really great deal to me. He's a. Um, He's a professor who writes uh, at NYU, who's also written about Jews in a way that I think is really... I don't... You know what? I've never gotten into... Oh, Yo Tropper's books mean a lot to me. Jonathan Tropper's books. Yes. These are much more fictive than anything else. There's more Heschel. There's Victor Frankl. There's... Um, Arya Kaplan, who I liked a lot more when I was younger than I do now, uh, but still have great respect for, of course. We republished all the works of Arya Kaplan with NCSY, actually. I find his his story incredibly moving. This book is really good by a guy named uh, Schiffman, Lawrence, from Texture Tradition, A History of the Second Temple and Rabbinic Judaism. Yes, former 1840, yes, of yes. course. Oh, really? Lawrence Schiffman was on 1840? Absolutely. I need to get that episode. I I think Lawrence Schiffman is the bee's knees. He's really great. David Grossman, To the End of the Land, that had a big impact on me as a young person. And of course, my favorite book ever, my favorite book ever, 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 is uh, a book that I think informed my worldview, is Chaim Patak's My Name is Esher Love. Ah, uh. An absolute. When, when did you begin reading? Like, are, were, were you a like kind of a hungry reader from a young age? I was, and also um, when I was younger. By the way, I I don't know if I can say this, but I probably can. Actually, I certainly can. Uh, Genji Cohan and I, one of the great TV writers, Genji Cohan, um, we did an adaptation for uh, for Netflix of My Name Is Usher Lev, which they decided not to make. But we have this script that we love and think is beautiful. Oh, my goodness. We need that. The Jewish people need that. If any listeners have any pull with any of the other streaming services, let's uh, let's absolutely get that. We have this gorgeous script, Ben Cosgrove, uh, who is who has a partnership with, I think, Mr. Feller, um, uh, uh, with a, co- a company called Leviathan, put it together, get, found us the rights, which I've been trying to get for years. <laughs> And yeah, it's a beautiful exercise in collaboration. I had a great time with Genji. But yeah, my name is Usher Lev. If you haven't read it, it is to me the defining fictive text of it does that thing, which is it's Tom Hanks's favorite book. It's Bono's favorite book. It's is that true? Mar- Yeah. It's Tom Hanks's favorite book. He talks about it on Alan Alda's podcast. <laughs> it's a gorgeous little, you know. It, That's the, a great little fact there. I had no he he read and loves Chaim Potex, My Name is Usher Lev, Tom Hanks. Someone said to me, Why does Lynn Manuel Miranda love My Name is Usher Lev? And I was like, Oh, why does a guy whose father is the most prominent Puerto Rican politician and community organizer in the United States care so much about My Name is Usher Lev when he wanted to be a slam poet? Uh, I think <laughs> Like, that's a really great example. Uh, and by the way, I hope you'll edit out some of the dead air while I look around my bookshelves. No, but, no, you know, no. This is great. But, you know, like, uh, but Lin-Manuel Miranda, like, that's a really great example of how Jewish art can be, re- can be, you know, dedicated to a Jewish identity and fully faithful to that Judaism and be accessible to, you know, Tom Hanks. Like, it's yeah. a beautiful, it's a really beautiful thing. What I really want to ask you, you mentioned it in passing, I plan to to ask you about it, is the difficulty, and, and we'll come back to books, but, but I, I, I want to hear a little bit more. You know, you had a friend, you, you described him as a Chavrusa who passed away, and you, you, you he was the person, I think he was the, the official director of the show, and now you are stepping out onto the stage uh, after having lost him. I'm curious how loss affects your ability to perform comedy. Well, we'll say, we'll say, I don't know. Um, 
best friend, person. person I should be doing this with <coughs> who should be David I have a solo comedy show opening on Broadway it, it, it never happens like I cannot stress to listeners who I hope aren't as familiar with the economic and curatorial models of Broadway that it for an unfamous comedian it never happens it's reserved for Colin Quinn Mike Birbiglia people who have been big stars and so this is a rare, it's like going to the moon. Like maybe I get to go back to the moon, but like truly for comedy, this is, it feels as rare as going to outer space, this. And, and so hold on. The point that I'm making is I'm experiencing this very confusing set of emotions where on one hand, this beautiful thing is happening. And today, you know, I have to go and, in 20 minutes because we're loading into the theater today and we're putting up the scenery and the lights and checking sound and doing wardrobe and all the little fun ins and outs of putting a show on a stage. And we're doing it on the nicest stage, the newest theater on Broadway, which is also paradoxically the oldest theater. They just did some remodel. So to just see- a fun fact, Alex, I want you to know my, chav- my actual Chavrusa, uh, who I learn uh, Sefer HaChinuch with, which is the book of all the mitzvahs, on every uh, Wednesday night. His name is J.J. Bruckner. He's actually the person who redesigned the theater that you're performing. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean... True story. I'm curious to... I mean, but all I'm saying is the... I mean, it's a gorgeous theater, and this is like getting to drive a Rolls Royce for two and a half months after you've been in, like, you know, a nice cars. But this is like the a one-of-a-kind Rolls Royce. And to be doing this without the guy who got me here, without the guy who I've worked with this guy for 11 years to get to this point. And so to not be able to cross this sort of um, finish line with him after such a marathon is the definition of bittersweet. I really. It feels biblical in a way, not to, not to cut you off like that, like, creating and yearning for a promised land that you're never able to enter uh, is it it feels Jewish to me uh, in the saddest way possible, but that's kind of the unfolding story that we're all a part of. You know, sometime I were, I wonder, and I'm aware this is not um, real, but sometimes I worry that, you know, I've like, I hit the rock somehow, you know, a reference yes. that will only make sense to the listeners of this podcast. But, <laughs> yes. And I'm yes. A, and I'm aware that that's magical thinking that is neither correct nor helpful. Although maybe, who knows, maybe someone's like, you shouldn't be consorting with all those homosexuals, Edelman. But, you know, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I truly am. Um, I, I was at his funeral this past weekend and it was just, uh, gosh, non-Jews wait a long time to bury. He died a month and a half ago with the inquest and the no shiva, just awake where everyone got steaming drunk. And it was, uh, <laughs> I'd said some kind of healing, I suppose. But I mean, um, gosh, it's a shame. And, uh, and yeah, we had a really, we had this really delicious process where he would provoke. I would ask a question or I would tell him a story and he'd interrupt me to ask provocations and my answers would sometimes come out as jokes. He'd write them down. And and literally from those notes is how this show was now born. I mean, the show, every joke you find in a different way. And there are jokes that I have affection for in the show because they were answers to someone after the show or they were a thought I had on a train or... One is a line. There's a line in the show that Steve Martin gave me when he came to see Which, it. I can't. Can it's, share? A, it's a callback, so it won't make sense oh, out of context. Okay. But you know, Steve Martin said you should call that back here. And I have such affection because when I do the joke, I'm like, I'm doing Steve Martin's joke. Um, if you're listening, the show was co-written by Steve Martin, technically, right? Steve Martin. <laughs> Very technically, but sure. Uh, there's a show on Broadway right now called Anne Juliet, which is all these Max Martin songs. This is some s- songwriter. Who is 
a technically brilliant songwriter and and uh and the story is written by a Canadian television writer and the and apparently it's a real good time and the credit for the writing of the song says Max Martin and Friends. And if I could, I would say the show is written by Alex Edelman and Community because it really is this community of conversation from which the show has arisen. My writing process is talking to people. I do sit down and write. I sit down at that desk over there and I, and I, but a lot of my writing is so-and-so said this, and maybe that's really interesting or so-and-so said this, and I had a reaction to it. And what was behind that reaction? And I should write for 30 seconds to see if I can discover the emotion behind that reaction. Cause maybe a lot of this is panning for gold. But the river that you're panning in is all of the conversations and, and reactions that you've had to the world that day, that week, that year. And it's a really interesting uh, collaborative process, which is nonlinear and yields big chunks every... Sometimes I can't remember when I wrote the show. I'm like, did I write it in little pieces? Did I write it all at once? I don't think I wrote it all at once. One of the jokes is a joke I've been trying to make work since, since uh, I graduated college. Then it finally, I found the right word for it. And then all of a sudden a work, a joke that didn't work for four years started working. Can you, can you share which joke that was? Um, or it's like, needs too much context. It needs too much context. That's the other thing. The show now is so embedded with all the other jokes in the show, but, um, it's a bit about, um, it's in a bit about, uh, a friend, friends of mine, uh, and how they've decided to raise their children, and yes. and it's a uh, and it's a really great, uh, it's a really great fun chunk to do. But it's got some of the newest jokes in the show and some of the oldest jokes in the show, and I feel really weird about it. I really like meaning that like I like it. It's just really confusing. My process is very uh, dialogue heavy, and if you looked around this apartment, you'd see like napkins with notes written on the back, and and there are n- notes on my phone, and eighty six pages of notes on my computer, and I record every set I ever do, and listen back to it sometimes, and sometimes I don't. You know, like there are just like dozens, hundreds of recordings. Wow, that is he's showing me the voice notes on his phone. That's quite a bit of voice notes. And these are it all looks like. Looks like you haven't gotten back to any uh, voicemails in a very long time, but no. uh, those are your own voice voice notes. Yeah, I have I have a lot of I have lots of them, and it's a really uh, but yeah, it's all it's all really wonderful, and it's all um, and the creation is a joy, and so uh, yeah. I I want to close because um, I know you have to go. You're checking out. You're you know really entering into this milestone, uh, and I hope we get to get together in person. We I'm will. curious. I'm curious what you think about, you know, you you just went to the moon, so to speak, to, to get a solo show on Broadway. Does that have an effect, the magnitude of this experience? Does that have an effect on what you creatively are looking forward to doing next? Do you, you know, like, it's not fun. You can go back to the moon a second time. Do you want to look for a different medium? Is your head, how does, how do you recover from success? Um... How do I recover from my success in terms of creating the next thing? Yeah. I don't know. I really don't. I'd be lying to you if I said I knew what to do next. I, I spoke to Tom Kitt about this. Tom Kitt is a music. He writes lyrics. He wrote the almost famous musical that just went to Broadway. He wrote a show called Next to Normal, which won both the Pulitzer and the Tony. A really special show. And... And I said, how do I do this next thing? And by the way, I'll thank you can put this on the podcast, but I'll thank you to like, you know, if you're listening, like this felt like a personal conversation, but it really helped me. And he said, it's not the next thing. It's just the thing. It's like, you're just doing things. Just keep doing things. Do the best you can on this thing and then move on. Do the best you can on this thing and then move on. If it demands more work, keep doing more work. It's like, it's not the next thing. It's just the thing. It was a short conversation. It was the first time I met Tom Kitt, but it was really, be- and I've, by the way, I've seen him around since then, like five or six times. And now like our, we have had this sort of instant friendship. I really, 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 really like Tom Kitt. Uh, but that really helped me reframe it. It's not the next thing, David. It's just the thing. I'll just keep doing things. I, I, I have this anxiety. I think about it every day for multiple minutes a day. 
It's a, it's a baseline anxiety I carry with me almost everywhere. Can you articulate the baseline anxiety? This is now therapeutic for me, and it's okay if, you, if you'd rather... The, base, not, the baseline, baseline anxiety, anxiety is that I've done something very successful and has, by and large, run the table, right? Like, it's done everything it can do. It's been nominated for every award it could possibly be nominated for, apart from one huge one. And, and hopefully it gets a chance to get seen for that award, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. But, like, this is just... And, and how do you follow that? But you don't, you just keep going. You just keep making things. And, and hopefully you make a Parnassa that's, de- that's, that's decent and you make work that resonates with lots of people, but you can't be like, Oh my God, how am I going to do something that's successful? You just have to, how do I do something that's good? That's, that's an artistic maturation of my voice. That is, uh, that is more mature, right? Like uh, that artistic maturation is a huge, part of this show for me. I've got to figure out what that, that, that maturing continues to look like. Very difficult, but I'll just go and try to do it. And if I don't, I went to the moon. And, uh, and if I do, I get to go back. But like, it's just, it's just uh, the secret to getting your show to Broadway. People ask me what the secret to getting your show to Broadway is. The secret is I, I found myself two dozen times explaining the concept of Dayenu, which is like an embarrassingly basic concept for everyone listening to this podcast, but a ridiculously yeah. advanced one for say a, you know, a mass market, uh, a mass market newspaper or something. But like the idea that whatever you're doing is enough. Like if I had just gotten to do my show with Adam in this pub above a shoe store in London, truly that would have been enough. And if I had just gotten to do the show off Broadway, if I had just gotten to do the show in front of Steve Martin or Jerry Seinfeld, or if I had just gotten to, you know, I know truly it would have been enough. Truly it would be enough to, because actually if I said to you and even, even cynically, if I said, David, I did this show and it only happened for a little while. Um, uh, and it ran in this, uh, and I did it in this pub above a shoe store. That's still like 85% impressive that I did a thing. And then if I was like, it went to Broadway, that's really cool. That means that thing was successful. But when you think about it, the fact that you've done a thing as a person is just, I wrote a screenplay. Oh, that's fantastic for a movie. Well, that's even more fantastic. And the movie got made. Wow. And it won an Oscar. I mean, it's great to, you know, but the biggest thing there isn't winning the Oscar. The biggest thing is writing the screenplay. Like it, it, you just have to do the thing. Alex, I cannot thank you enough. I hope I get to see uh, this thing, and I hope that all the other things that you create continue to uplift you and Amcha Yisrael, the Jewish people, as you've done until now. Uh, it really is heartening. It, it is a comedy show, but there's something very serious and very purposeful that animates what you do that, that lies just beneath the surface. Anytime we speak, it bubbles up, and I hope that the next time we speak, more than anything else, it's in person, uh, with food, connecting, uh, really, your friendship means a great deal to me. And uh, wishing you just continued Hatzlach and success in everything that you do. Thank you so much. And it means a lot to me. And uh, and look, I'll, I'll see you soon. And if you're listening to this podcast, please come to my show. Because the show is written for you. The show is written for Jews who are curious about their Jews. It's also written to entertain non-Jews. Um, yes. And it's written so that no matter whether or not you've met a Jew before, the show is still accessible. I wrote, I did the show in Wales in front of an audience of people who, when I asked how many of them had met a Jew, uh, I think like maybe 10 of them raised their hands. So like the show is, you know, like I said, it's not Kirov, but it is something that, that it, look, if, if you're listening to this podcast, please come to the show. So I wasn't going to fight you on it. I have a very expansive notion of what uh, Kirov is in the kind of the, the literal sense. It brings you close. And this brings you close. It brings you close to you and your art and to Jewish identity and to just not even if being Jewish. It brings you close to being thoughtful about what identity means uh, for whatever it is in your life. So, yes, go check out Alex. Uh, I'll try to sneak in. My wife has been begging me. Can you get tickets again? I, I, I saw it one time with uh, with a friend, Jacob Shoulder. Shout out to him. Uh, but 
I'll try to sneak in there again. We'll be in touch. You let me know when you come so we can have a, we can have a quick bite and hello. Absolutely. Take it easy. Continue Thank you. Success. All Thank love, you. Alex. Thanks, well. David. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Alex and I, you know, we're able to bond over that, what he calls baseline anxiety. I talk about it all the time. Uh, when you're involved in a creative endeavor, anytime I have an episode that, you know, really hits and goes, you know, like a little bit viral outside of our uh, weekly listeners, but reaches the wider community, like the wider world or whatever it is. And that's happened on multiple occasions, of course. Uh, my baseline anxiety kicks in. What's next? What's next? How do I top it? And it can be very hard. It's hard as social media as a condition. You go viral on social media, you hit the top, everybody's sharing what you do. And now you're like, uh oh, uh, what's next? And I find the way that he handles it and just the way that he thinks kind of so Talmudically grappling with his own identity. I find it uh, personally inspiring. You should definitely find time to check out his show uh, when it works for you. It's running uh, straight through the summer into August. And uh, really, it was an illuminating experience going to a show. I found it absolutely uh, hilarious. And it's such a it's such an interesting crowd who comes and is connected to him. Uh, so really, uh, it's with a lot of nachas and wishing him a continued success. And I really just appreciated his appreciation for 1840, it really meant a lot to me. He's somebody who's, you know, he's been on television. I was at a show where he was interviewed by Stephen Colbert, uh, and he reached out to me and said, I, I want to come back on 1840. This audience uh, meant something to him, and it's really a testament, not to him and not to me, it's a testament to our listeners, the people who came up to him and said, oh, I heard about this from 1840, Uh The way he spoke about it uh, was everything that I think we're trying to create here, really grappling, uplifting, and centering our Jewish identity, no matter the chaos of the modern world in which we live. Uh, He is doing his best at that, and I I hope that his art and his future projects and his book lists uh, give us strength to continue uh, grappling, growing uh, together. Of course, we have another interview. I hope you're on some long July 4th weekend uh, car ride while you're listening. Uh, I apologize to our guests. I, I, I don't even know if they knew that I'm, I'm joining them together. But once Alex told me that they study Torah together, I said, you know what? This, this is going to work. We're going to give this a shot, a long car ride. Uh, why not? Uh, so hopefully this will get you to the mountains and back. But uh, it is really my pleasure to introduce somebody who has a chain, a graciousness, a, I don't want to use the word charisma, but there is such a welcomeness uh, to Sarah Hurwitz. Her book really is a neon entrance sign. I love the title. It's called Here All Along and has the longest subtitle I have ever seen in a book. Challenge me if I'm wrong. The subtitle is Finding Meaning Spirituality and a deeper connection to life in Judaism after finally choosing to look there. Uh, But I love the notion of here all along. I think a lot of our listeners uh, have been on journeys in their life, and the realization that really all of the contours and vicissitudes of our life hopefully bring us to a point where we realize here all along, uh, and Yiddishkeit as a family anchored in the values of Torah, This is who we are. This is what our lives are all about, and we are here all along. So it is really my privilege and pleasure. I'm so excited. I really consider her a friend, even though we only are able to email kind of, we email like two, three times a year. Maybe we'll, we'll Zoom together once a year, every other year, but there's such a warmth and friendship and welcomeness to her that even though we only, we met over, it's probably been 10 years by now. Uh, but we've stayed in touch, and I really, really tre- treasure her friendship and her work. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our conversation with Sarah Hurwitz. She really came to national attention as the speechwriter for Michelle Obama. She wrote an absolutely phenomenal book called Here All Along. It is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Sarah Hurwitz. Hello, it is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, David. Sarah, I'm really, really excited about this. And I want to kind of begin with your early trajectory, because before writing a book on Judaism, which is fascinating, challenging, important, you really began your career as a speechwriter. And it happens to be 
I have work as a speechwriter. I am fascinated by what that work is. I'm fascinated by the process of writing itself. And I first wanted to begin with kind of asking, and I get this question all the time, you're a graduate of Harvard Law School. Why on earth did you decide to become a speechwriter? So it's really funny. I actually was a speechwriter before I went to law school. I had a couple of kind of junior speechwriting jobs after college. I had interned in Vice President Al Gore's speechwriting office when I was in college. And the guys I interned for helped me get these first two jobs. They were total failures. I really didn't know how to speechwrite back then. So I went to law school thinking, OK, done. No more speechwriting. And I met a guy named Josh Gottheimer, who is now a congressman from New Jersey, was my law school classmate, and he'd been a speechwriter for President Clinton. And we started freelance writing together. And he really taught me how to write, how to, how to speech write, how to structure a speech, how to write to be heard rather than read, which are two very different skills. And then we just got jobs on campaigns, Wes Clark, John Kerry. I became Hillary Clinton's chief speechwriter in 08. They all lost. And then I got on the Obama campaign. So I'm actually curious about that, about that process. What I have found in this, particularly in the Jewish world, our best writers are often terrible speakers and our best speakers are often <laughs> terrible writers. That's what I have noticed. I don't want to name names because I don't want to make anybody feel that. But but there are people who I fell in love with their writing and I'm like, oh, I need to hear them speak. And then you're in the audience and you're like crestfallen where it's like, wait, this this is this is the person. So I'm curious with you, why is it, what's different about writing a speech than writing, let's say, a book or an article? So writing to be read versus writing to be heard, two very different things. I just want to stop because what I just did is I articulated, I just uttered two sentence fragments, not grammatical. If you read them written down, you'd say, well, these are sentence fragments, right? This is not actually proper English. And that's just such a key difference. When you are writing for the ear, it's a different kind of tradition. It's an oral thing that you're doing. You don't need, you don't have punctuation. You speak ungrammatically. Sentence fragments are fine. But when you're writing to be read with the eye, it's it's more formal, right? It's more contained within the boundaries of grammar and punctuation. And it's it's hard for people to toggle between the two. You know, they're just two very different art forms. And also with speaking, you have all of the issues around delivery, right? How comfortable are you in your own skin? I think so often very good writers kind of get up and almost like read an op-ed at people. And it doesn't work because it sounds too stilted and formal. And they sound like they are reciting a speech. You know, when people are like, good morning, it is a great pleasure and a tremendous honor to be here today. You've never once greeted your colleagues that way, right? You say, oh, hey, morning, great to be here. Like if you wouldn't say something to one person, you shouldn't say it to many people. It actually doesn't really get better. So they're they're just they're two different skills. They're two different forms of writing, and I think oftentimes people struggle to kind of toggle between them. So I, I'm I'm curious in the actual process. Take me through a classic speech that you would write for. I don't know Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama. That doesn't really matter to me. But they tell you what, like when I speech write, it's like, oh, I'm speaking at this event. Do they give you bullet points of what they want to hit upon or you're giving the What's the process of writing somebody else's words? So it depends so much on who you're writing for. You know, that I'm sure there are people out there who just say, I don't know what I want to say. Give me something to react to. And I don't like this. There is that kind of speaker. But, you know, I'll say someone like Michelle Obama, you know, the process was Quite different because she is someone who knows who she is. She always knows what she wants to say. So the process for her would be, you know, I would do some, it's, let's say it's a commencement speech. I would do some research in advance on the university, on its history, its student body, demographics. I'd write her a memo and then we would sit down and she'd say, okay, thanks. I got the memo. Here's what I'm thinking. And she would just dictate a lot to me. She would dictate, okay, here's the core thesis and theme that I want to put forth. And here's stuff I want to say. And she would just dictate paragraphs and paragraphs of language. And I would type verbatim on my computer because I really wanted to capture what she was saying. She might, you know, say data that she wants to find. She might say stories she wants to tell. She might remember quotations she wants to share. And so it's my job to kind of write that all down verbatim. And then I would go back to my office and kind of arrange that into a draft, right? Because like a draft, a speech needs structure, it needs a beginning, a middle, an end. It needs to flow well. And that's really the challenge of writing a good speech is figuring out the order in which the paragraphs will come. Structure. Structure is destiny. Structure. Stru I always tell it is when I'm destiny. talking about any writing, I'm like, 
You don't need the fanciest words. You don't even need to know how grammar works. Structure, structure, structure. It's hard to write a good speech with a bad structure. And it's actually hard to write a bad speech with a good structure. That's just the truth. So, you know, once I've come up with a draft, I would then send it around to probably about 50 people in the White House, fact checkers, communications people, political policy. A lot of people would read it and just say, "Okay, you know, our lawyers might say, hey, you know what? That's a legal issue. You can't say that. A fact checker might say, you know what, sir, that's not accurate. You need to use this statistic. A communications person might say, you know, I think the press is going to misunderstand this part of it. You got to clarify. And so I would maybe take their edits, maybe not, right? A lot of the, this is the thing where I think writers go wrong. It's that they get edits from people and they just kind of mindlessly type them in. And then it's sort of a patchwork quilt written by community yeah. and it makes no sense. I call it Frankenstein writing where it's like all these exactly. little parts. Ugh. Writing by committee never works. You got to control your piece of writing. And so, you know, I, you need to figure out, okay, can I weave this in? There's a lot of negotiation, right? A policy expert might say, Sarah, you need to weave in these 19 policy points. And I'll be like, it's a commencement speech. No, you know, we can have a line about the policy, but that's it. <laughs> and then I would send that draft to Mrs. Obama and she would edit. We go back and forth. She would edit. I would edit. She would edit. I would edit. And then she would actually run through it just so we, we could hear it. And she would edit while running through it. This is a super technical question. Again, I almost need to apologize to our listeners because I'm so interested in speech writing. Um, when you edit, is she editing by hand on top of print or, or do you share in Google Docs? How is that back and forth process working? So it's different for different principles. She would edit by hand. She actually had beautiful handwriting, um, which was great. And you actually saw President Obama did the same thing. You know, there are lots of photographs of his of drafts of speeches just covered with his handwriting, Mark yellow ups. legal pads, which is pages of his handwriting. So she edited by hand. Do you get to take any of those home? No, those are presidential records. You, they belong uh, to... No, 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 no. They are all in an archive somewhere. So no, I don't. I had a learning partner, a Chavrusa, who published a lot of the notes of Rav Herschel Schechter, uh, who is one of the senior Rosh Yeshiva in Yeshiva University. And the the markups by hand that Rav Schechter made on the notes, and you see the attention to detail. Again, this is rabbinic writing, but you see the attention to detail. Thank God. I mean, maybe there should be presidential records for Roshe Yeshiva, uh, but but we snuck a few of those pages away because they're, they're really, really fascinating. It's a window to see like who this person is. I'm really curious, and I think the struggle is very different for you and I, because when I'm writing, very often I'm writing for other um, rabbis or Jewish leaders, and... The difficulty that I face, and I'm curious how you dealt with this or if you struggled with it at all, is like, I'll have an awesome line or turn of phrase, and I'm also, you know, in the public square. I also want to have my own voice. I also want to publish op-eds in the Wall Street Journal and, you know, all that stuff. And I'm like, shoot, I don't want to give them my best stuff. I'll, I'll give them, like, right, like the cut right underneath how did you manage, if at all, like your own, I don't want to use the word ego, but your own sense of self, your own voice, you're giving somebody else your words. It's like being a speechwriter is like a little bit like the little mermaid, like you're giving over Ursula all your best words and then you're kind of left voiceless, but you know, you're able to walk around and do your thing. Did, did you grapple with that? No, because, you know, with someone like Michelle Obama, I, I was never scripting her. No one puts words in Michelle Obama's mouth. Let me tell you, I was not. So I was never felt like I was scripting her. Rather, I was channeling her. You know, she was always the guiding force and I was taking that and channeling it. And sure, I wordsmithed it. Sure, there was some language and ideas. But at the end of the day, my focus was really like, OK, what would she want to say? It was trying to really channel her voice. And keep in mind, when you are a White House speech writer, you have no self. There is no public self, right? You can't do anything in your own name, really. It's, I mean, you can, it gets complicated and it's not, it's just not really appropriate. So I didn't have a public self or any kind of, you know, writing self then. So I was just, anything I was doing, that was my full writing life. And the thing is, I don't do that anymore because like you, I, I want to write my own name. I want to say things in my own name. And I actually just... I feel like I'm not really in a place where I want to write for other people anymore. So I don't. I haven't done that really since the White House. Yeah. I, for anybody who's thinking about a career in speech writing, it is not a great parallel track to your own writing career because you're always juggling. I don't know how script writers even do it. Like your best jokes you want to like keep for yourself, like, you know, sitcom writers and all that stuff. 
So I'm curious when you were writing, what books and what previous speeches would you draw upon, if any, to kind of inform or you just sit with a blank piece of paper and like take that initial memo and, and dictation and, and go, or were you drawing upon earlier works and earlier books, speeches to inspire you? I would sometimes draw on American history. That was a big part of, you know, that I think to be a good presidential or first lady speech writer, you really need to have a pretty good grasp on American history because it's, it's, you know, you're, these, these leaders are in the flow of history and especially leaders like the Obamas, whose existence as president and first lady was so historic and so unusual. And so I think knowing history was important, but you know, when I was writing for Mrs. Obama, I was I would sometimes look at previous speeches given by first ladies or if she was traveling to a foreign country, I would look, you know, what have presidents and first ladies said in this foreign country just to get a sense of like what's culturally appropriate or whatever. But there weren't I wouldn't say there were a lot of books I looked into. I, it was more people I reached out to. You know, if she was speaking at univer- a university, I would want to talk to students at the university. I would want to talk to administrators, faculty alumni, just to get a sense of like, okay, who are these people? You know, any organization we were speaking to, I would always want to speak to the leader and some members just to get a sense of like, what what are these people's stories? Because Mrs. Obama always wanted to celebrate other people's stories. That was what she was there for, right? She was there to say, you all are doing amazing work and I see you and here's what you're doing. And here's why I'm here. It's because I care about the same issues. Let's talk about that. So it was more consulting people than books. And I'm curious, were there any specific speeches or lines that you had written that had your DNA and stamp on it that you remain proud of, that you like now that 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 10 years over that you're even allowed to like kind of claim that I was actually behind that. I'm very proud of it. It's hard for me to do that because every speech was a collaboration. Right. Like, I don't think there was any I can't imagine any speech where Mrs. Obama didn't guide it, didn't provide the the download and the input. So I, it's hard for me to say, oh, that one was mine. You know, that's just never the case. I mean, the line when they go low, we go high. That was her line, not mine. She came up with that. I just typed it into the speech. That is absolutely fascinating. So I have a question that is really not about speech writing, but really kind of the backdrop of the decision not to um, to become a speech writer, but really what you do after you have you now have a harvard law degree you spent time in the white house your speech writing for the first lady what on earth possessed you when this is done to write a book about judaism meaning you wrote this book here all along finding meaning spirituality and a deeper connection <laughs> to life in judaism got a very long subtitle and then finally choosing to look there which i like i think it's a very sweet cover what I found most fascinating is almost the choice. Like you had the pick of the litter, uh, Harvard law degree, white hat. Like th- th- that's that's the duo that you need to open up any door. And instead, like I'm like imagining you looking and thinking like I could be in a company, I could be a director of communications, I could be. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to write about Judaism. Like, <laughs> like, like, like to- yeah, no, it's you, the, my colleagues actually were asking me the same question. Like when I would tell them I was doing this, they were like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry what now? Yeah. You're going to write a book about what? I actually, I asked one political pundit for advice and I told her I wanted to write this book on Judaism. And she was like, no, 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 no. No. Your first book is on politics or speech writing or Michelle Obama. And then you can write that weird book that no one will ever read. I was yeah. Like, wow. That's so hard. <laughs> Um, but look, the reality was like, look, I grew up with a very, you know, I would say mediocre Jewish background, you know, kind of half-hearted. We, you know, reluctantly showed up at the shul twice a year for high holidays. I went to Hebrew school, really wasn't much. I felt like there just wasn't much to see there. I became a bat mitzvah and I thought like, okay, enough. I'm out. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, I'm good. And then 25 years later, I broke up with a guy I was dating. I was 36 years old. I was really anxious and lonely. And I happened to hear about an intro to Judaism class at the JCC in Washington, where I live. And I thought like, okay, good. That'll fill a Wednesday night. It was not on a It was not some deep spiritual journey. And people always wanted to make a story out of this. Like, oh, you were searching for meaning and you got transformed. Very Christian, by the way. Just FYI. And I kind of like, oh, you were saved. Like, no, it's not how it worked. But I just took this class thinking, whatever. And I was just blown away by what I found. You know, here was 4,000 years of wisdom from millions of my ancestors about what it means to be human, about how to live a good life, about how to be a deeply good person, 
about how to find profound spiritual connection that wasn't just God is a man in the sky who controls things, which I've never believed. And I just thought like, where has this been all my life? Like, I didn't see this in two dull services or a boring Seder, which was the Judaism when I grew up. And I just, I was like, totally odd. And I just started learning. So I took another class. I read hundreds of books. I studied with many teachers, many rabbis of all denominations. I mean, it's a quite a diverse crew that I've learned from. And I just thought, I want to share this tradition with people. Like, I, I want people to see what they've been missing. Like, so many Jews don't even know what Judaism has to offer. And so that was the goal of my book. And the funny thing was, is I really had in mind a target audience of disengaged Jews like me. And I wanted to show them like, look, this is a smart, radical, countercultural, transformative tradition. It's so much smarter and deeper than you thought. I'm going to share it with you. But the wild thing is, is that when it came out, I had like Chabad rabbis telling me they loved it. I had so many deeply observant people be like, oh, this book was for me. And I'm like, no, no, I, I didn't write this book for you. They said, no, 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 Sarah, this book is for me. Like, I don't necessarily agree with everything you write. I don't practice like you do. But I saw your 550 endnotes. It's like, you clearly know what you're talking about. And I see your passion and your love. And there are just so many fresh ideas. Like I've had so many observant people say to me, this book made me fall in love with Judaism again. This book reinvigorated my davening. It reinvigorated my this, my that. You know, that for me was really moving. I think part of, you know, what we've uncovered or tapped into on 1840 is that there is a misconception even within uh, the Orthodox community, uh, and particularly looking uh, when you look out and look into the Orthodox community, and I'm not saying the Orthodox community is the only observant community, but particularly right. the community that I'm affiliated with, that like, oh, like, if, you, if you're if you in it, then, like, you don't need, like, the more contemporary resonance to pick this up, the journeying, that, and, and it's a total misconception, I believe, that those the internal journey and the grappling with the uh, kind of received tradition rather than chosen tradition could almost be more difficult in a way because you grew up with it. You took it for granted. There are so many sociological filters because it's your neighborhood. It's your family. Right. It's your your competition in a lot of ways um, that 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 could make that even more even more difficult. And I want to talk about those two different struggles of kind of. I've always looked at you as like an insider, yep. outsider, outsider, yeah. insider. No, within communally, like you, you have deep knowledge. You, you're not like you never signed a, a clear, um, like <laughs> NFL contract with any yep. uh, denomination <laughs> or community or which, which, which I've always appreciated. And I'm curious for you in your engagement within the book, did you? explore the actual like lived denominational experience across the spectrum and see what is bubbling up in American Judaism right now. And, and, and what did you learn? Not about, not about what you were teaching, but what did you learn in your interactions with Jewish communities? Yeah, I did. You know, I definitely explored so many different ways of approaching this tradition. And I think, you know, I've been reflecting a lot on like, why has this book been touched, you know, been so resonant with so many folks who are very traditionally observant. And I think at the end of the day, it's that they see that I am as much in love with and have as much reverence for this tradition as they do. You know, as much as you might, you know, it's easy to kind of, you know, I, I know I'm sort of seen as like a contemporary thinker or, you know, non-Orthodox kind of out of the box. But the truth is, I actually have a, a strong instinct of wanting to preserve and and bring to life what is there. You know, I, I always get a little uneasy when I hear someone being like, oh, I want to try this totally new thing and we're going to ditch this thing and I'm going to make up this new thing because I think it's so special and me, 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 me. I'm like, maybe you're not that great. Maybe this 4,000 years of tradition actually has something to teach you. Maybe it's not about you teaching these 4,000 years of tradition. Maybe this has something to teach you. And so as I was exploring these different traditions, I found some real resonance with observant folks, even though that's not me, just seeing, the, I mean, especially seeing the power of Shabbat, you know, just seeing the thick, rich community around it, seeing what they were doing, seeing the, I don't know, these like really thriving communities that I think are missing in other parts of the world. And that, and I was very moved by that. You know, this has been our way for thousands of years where we don't just ditch a tradition because we don't like it. We really sit and we sit with it. We think about this. We dig to the bottom of it. We try to understand it and we innovate slowly and carefully, but thoughtfully. And I think there's something really powerful to that for me. 
tell me a little bit about, you know, you said you read hundreds of books, uh, you know, so much of the theme that we're doing now are the book recommendations. What are the books that jumped out at you uh, in kind of paving the road to writing about Judaism? You obviously didn't jump in with a, with a blank slate. What were those books on that journey? Yeah, I think the ones that really helped me when I was first starting out, especially everything by Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. I mean, I just think he is such a moving and inspiring writer. He's so deeply learned, but for someone who doesn't have a deep learned background, he's accessible. So I thought he was wonderful. Uh, Rabbi Alan Liu, I think his books on spirituality are breathtaking, right? Again, such a deep investigation of text, but in this very moving, fresh way. I mean, I think the two of them were you know, hugely shaped me. I also look at someone like Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, you know, renewal guy, kind of out there, but has a deep, you know, he's a Chabad rabbi, so he has a very deep grounding in the text. And, you know, not everything he says is my jam, but I found his creativity and his learnedness to be really exciting. So I think those were a few people that really, I think, drew me in, especially in the beginning. One of the big emphases in your book, and it's something that is animates at the heart of what we do at 1840, and I've written about it, is the notion of Judaism as a family. And, you know, that's something that we've always grappled with, that we're really family first. It only became a religion secondarily, but there is a familial bond uh, among among the people. And I am curious for you, like in this contemporary modern world, do you still sometimes feel adrift in your lived Jewish communal experience or do you feel like you have found a family? So I do feel like I found a family. You know, I do feel like I'm very connected to so many different Jews in so many different parts of America and around the world. But I will say, you know, I'm unmarried. I don't have kids. And I, I will say that the t- typical, you know, shul Jewish community life really isn't does not contemplate a single 45-year-old woman, right? It's just it's not really structured on me. Even an institution like Shabbat, is not really structured around someone without a family of their own. So I I do kind of think I'm an unusual fit in that way, but it doesn't really bother me that much. So I don't know. I am. I think that's true of me. I think I have a kind of odd approach to this, but I think my approach is actually more and more common. You're seeing the rise of non-denominational, of Jews who don't belong to any denomination. I'm actually not really in the minority of, as, as someone who's unmarried, about half of Americans are not married you know, there's a significant number of Jews who don't have kids. So it's like, okay, this is a changing demographic. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to, to see how Jewish institutions accommodate that. I'm curious, just in your experiences, I I, I I feel comfortable enough with him to mention him by name, but I could take it out if you don't want me to mention his name. Uh, I was having a meal uh, with a friend that I think many of our listeners may know, uh, David Lichtenstein from Muncie, New York. And uh I've been to his house many times for Shabbos. Hope to get back there uh, sometime soon. <laughs> and we're at the meal, and he like mentioned in passing, he was like, "Oh, you know who was here last week? Sarah Hurwitz." Yep. Uh, I, when I heard that name, uh, uh, assumed that he was talking about the Rabbah, which I also found somewhat surprising, uh, given where you know he is communally. But he's like, "No, the speechwriter." I'm like, "Oh, I know Sarah," and I'm curious for you. Not that specific Shabbos meal, but when you spend a Shabbos, mm-hmm. and I assume that's not the only time, within the Orthodox community, tell me what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Um, because I assume, I could imagine that we superimpose very often the mechanics that are tried and true within our community. Certainly marriage is like a very heavy topic that we when you go to a meal and it's like a predominantly orthodox group do you find it like offensive annoying or frustrating if it's like can we set you up like can we like right away like that's like the (laughs) it's so funny first of all i love david lichtenstein he's so deeply learned i just i have such respect for his learnedness his generosity i mean his his job at table was amazing oh it's wild i actually felt Oh, it's it's just like everyone's talking and it's so vibrant. And I felt so welcomed, you know, and this is the thing that is not the only, you know, very observant Shabbos table, which I have sure you know, spent time at. Right. This is something. Right. And I actually it's funny. You know, like, what do you do? Right. What do you do wrong? I mean, I think what you know, I don't I can't really say anything's wrong. Right. I, I don't I just I, I, I see something really wonderful. I see people coming together, enjoy celebrating. I think there's a real 
know, just like such beauty there and power there. So I, I don't know. For me, it's like wonderful. I do sometimes feel a little bit awkward because I didn't grow up with this. So I feel like in some ways I'm always, I have a little bit of that imposter syndrome where this isn't my native language. So I always feel it's like when we get to the benching, every time we get to the benching, I'm like, fine, fine. I'm a bad Jew. Okay. Everyone knows now, right? It's like, I can get through the kiddish, but it's like, you know, my Hebrew isn't great. You know, there's sort of a feeling of like, oh, I'm not quite here. You know, I think I do see sometimes see this kind of tendency to assume that Jews like me are, you know, totally uninformed, know nothing, don't care, are dismissive. And you know what? Sometimes that's true, right? I see it myself when I I engage with Jews who are like, oh, I'm just a cultural Jew. Oh, social justice is my Judaism. And it just kind of breaks my heart because like social justice is also your Christianity and your Islam and your Buddhism and your being a decent person, right? That's not, but they, they don't, they haven't had access to anything more. And that was me 10 years ago. But I think sometimes I, I feel that weight of assumption on my shoulders when I walk into a room and it's almost like, I feel like a talking horse. It's like, I'm like, I know who Rashi is. And they're like, whoa, the <laughs> horse is talking. Everyone just, or they're just like, I'll say something and they'll be like, what? what? How did you know that? I <laughs> can't believe it. They're like, you're going to die for the perplexed. I'm like, I have, believe mm. it or not. You know, it's like, there is that kind of shock that someone like me might like know some things and can actually participate in the discourse. And they're like, so surprised. I actually think it's very sweet, you know, and I, and I get it. Right? So many people like me, we don't know a lot and that's a real yeah. problem, but I, I would like, my book was designed to kind of bridge that gap and to actually speak to, you know, to kind of bring more togetherness in our family. So I'm curious when you write to a Jewish community, when you share with a Jewish community, and I know this because I am very active on social media, uh, we're a tough audience. We're not always a super easy audience to talk to. The first time that you share anything about Judaism with a Jewish audience, like, I always feel like the look is like, who gave you the right? Like, who, like, 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 who, who appointed you? There's like an averse instinctive reaction to being non hierarchical. And we don't like when somebody comes and be like, let me explain it to you. It's like right away, all the Jewish defenses come up. Like, I'll figure this out myself. You, so I'm curious. What, if any, negative feedback did you receive uh, from the book? Were there any passages that either for people from less, let's say, Jewishly educated communities, from more Jewishly educated communities, every community wants everything to be just for them. That's what I find so hard sometimes, and you always want everything to reflect your experience. Yeah. It's the struggle of 1840 in a lot of ways. Because, you know, I, I, we're not the largest Jewish podcast, but I like to think that we're one of the most diverse. And I always get letters of like, how dare you speak to this person and to that person? And like, they're not like me and that I have an issue with their political position or a religious position. And I'm just like, maybe not everything's for everybody. I'm curious if you got any of that kind of feedback. This is the wild thing. I spent months in a state of just constant anxiety, just preparing myself to just get pummeled. Right? I was like, everyone's going to be mad. I'm going to, I'm going to anger this group and that group. And th-. no, I, I, it, this thing that has shocked me is that the reception I've gotten has been overwhelmingly positive. You know, I've gotten little things here and there. Where people are like, oh, I wish you'd talked more about this, or you didn't think about that, which I, I think are generally right. You know, I think there are things that are missing from the book. And I really Can you give examples of that, like what you felt were missing. They're like, well, why didn't you talk more about the importance of community? And I was like, oh, they're right. Mm-hmm. You know, like, yeah. they're right. Like there are certain things like Simone was upset that I didn't talk more about Israel. And she was right. You know, there were just certain things that I you can't do everything in a book. But let me give you an example. Like when I speak to Jewish audiences, here's something I might say. And you can judge whether how you think it will be received. Something I often say is like, you know, it so frustrates me, this old anti-Semitic slander that Christianity is a religion of love, but Judaism is a religion of law. You know, it's, it's just legalistic and nitpicky. And that so enrages me because what people don't realize is that Jewish law is how we reflect and manifest love at a very, very high level, a very rigorous level in our daily lives. So when there is a Jewish law that says, if you've loaned money to someone who's really financially struggling and you see them coming down the street... Try not to run into them. You know, you're going to embarrass them. You're going to stress them out. And you could say, well, how legalistic, how weedy. No, actually what that law is doing is is attempting to inculcate an exquisite sensitivity to the needs and humanity of every single person. 
that quote weediness of Jewish law, that's actually pushing you to look closer and closer and closer at every individual human being and see how they are created in the image of God, right? That is what Jewish law is doing. So laws that say, help the poor, care for workers. Okay, fine. That's lovely. Having big feelings with your heart is, is nice. Please go ahead, but meaningless, right? But that law that says, no, you, you see that person coming and you think, how might they feel? You actually empathize with their indebtedness, with their stress. And you say, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that to them. I'm not going to harm their dignity in that way. That is the power of Jewish law. Now, who's going to, like, there, here's the thing. That is something that the most, you know, disengaged Jew can say, hey, that's really moving. And the most from Jew can say, oh, she's actually studied Jewish law. Like, she actually knows what she's talking about. And wow, that's a that's an interesting point about it, right? So it's like, that's the kind of thing I do with my book. So I don't know, it's hard to disagree with that, right? Well, I think the thing for me that I find most surprising and the pushback that I assume you had gotten was not actually from the Orthodox community that I think gives rather liberally a pass to somebody who's like, you didn't grow up in our community, you're grappling with all the right questions, like, we agree with, let's say, I don't know, 60, 70% of your conclusions, like, you know, you know, you got you got a pass, like, don't worry, we're not, we're not, we're not going to examine this and like, we're not going to come out and <laughs> put you excommunicate you <laughs> i have to be more worried about that you don't you don't have to be worried about that right. what i right. was actually most kind of surprised about and i think it's actually part of what initially connected us we met what a fascinating group we met the jewish week used to have these like gatherings it felt a little bit like the protocols of the elders of zion just <laughs> without any without any power like we would we went away to this retreat and there were like really important like JCC Federation people, and there were like maybe one or two like actual celebrities. I forgot who they were, like newscasters who were there. And I <laughs> yep. remember I, I was very young. I had not accomplished anything. I, I don't even know why, frankly, I was there. But I had my cousin who was there, Alti Carper, who's a former guest in oh. this very series. And Amen. and I had um, and Shulam Dean was there, another former guest yeah. on 1840. <laughs> and I don't know, like, I think it was me, you, Shulam and Alti who had like the. I, I, I remember speaking with this group. And the thing that I think surprised me most about you um, was you worked in a predominantly democratic political universe and you you know you're with the obama administration you work for hillary clinton you worked for you had all of the uh markings that somebody from a distance would assume that you are a more classic um I i'm trying to f say this in a way that's not going to get offend anybody <laughs> but i'm uh it's going to be very hard but a more classic like bleeding heart liberal in your religious sensibilities like you're like thinking like tikkun olam is like let's start with that and work everything backwards i happen to be a huge fan of tikkun olam i don't i don't bash it i'm 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 a huge fan of it it just it's it's filtered through so much and i met you and i'm like you're like a non-orthodox litvak like you're like a non because <laughs> you're not even like touchy-feely hasidic in a way like that's not your you're not rainbow talus, uh, no, big purple no. yarmulke. Like you're not that <laughs> either. And I was like, I know I'm so confusing. No, you were. And I was like, just like very <laughs> intrigued that like you, you're like into like let's get. And I, the people that I thought would be most frustrated by you are like, finally, we have a Jew from the Obama and Clinton administration who's coming out and writing a book about Judaism. This is surely will be for us. And I feel like, were there not people disappointed that you didn't lean in to that iteration or manifestation of Judaism that is more social justice for it first? Look, you don't need Judaism to do social justice. You don't need Judaism to be a Democrat, right? Like, I just, I just, I, I think that those folks are getting more than enough of that in the secular world. And that's wonderful. And of course, that's in Judaism. But Judaism has an actual specific, unique approach to social justice, which so many people don't even know about. And so I actually think they were really excited to see like, oh, wait a second. It's not just tikkun olam, yay, social justice. There's yeah. actually a deep approach to this that's very specific and actually quite moving and useful. So I really didn't get pushback. In fact, I, I got people were really 
that were like, oh my gosh, this is what I needed, right? Like I didn't know this stuff. I had no idea that Judaism had so much to say that's relevant. You know, 10 years ago, David, like I knew what the Democrat and Republican parties said about criminal justice, immigration, poverty. I had no idea that Judaism had anything to say. I, I knew what Catholics said about reproduction, about reproductive rights and contraception and abortion. I didn't know that Judaism had anything to say. You know, if you were a Jew who shows up twice a year at a shul and goes to a boring Seder, why on earth would you think that Judaism has wisdom for your life? And so when you actually say to these people, hey, here's 4,000 years of wisdom, and it's a lot deeper and a lot more powerful than this whatever crap you found online or at your ayahuasca retreat, they're actually like, okay. Like, I think you see a lot of disengaged Jews, they are yearning for depth. And they find it in places that, frankly, I think are silly. And I don't think are very deep. And when you actually show them something that's deep, when you make it accessible to them, it's transformative. But this is not an accessible tradition. You know, it's just not. It took me thousands and thousands of hours to get to the deepest part of it. Everything in Judaism is hyperlinked with everything else. There's nowhere to start. And you just have to dive in and just really apply yourself. And a lot of people don't have time. So I wanted to kind of save them some of that time, but also really show them the depths. And that is hard to do. I will tell you, very, very hard to do. You wrote this book on Judaism. I'm curious, would you, if you were to write another book on Judaism, would you, would, would, would you go into a different topic? Do you have another Jewish book in you or you're looking to explore something else entirely? So I am writing another book. Uh, I just started another book, actually. I know. Surprise, uh, which I'm very excited about. And this one is me kind of stepping back and saying, wait a second. Why was it that for the first 36 years of my life, I was so instinctively averse to Judaism? Why was the Judaism that I saw for the first 36 years of my life so odd? You know, why Why was Judaism for me like three holidays? That's very strange. You know, like, wait a second. I'm, you know, now that I know the incredible depths and like vastness of Judaism, it's a little shocking to me what I grew up with. And so I'm really beginning to look back into history, to look back into what happened in, you know, when we became emancipated, hated, what happened in modernity with our attempts to fit in? What did we do when we made Judaism into a Christian style religion? Um, and, and you know, I'm not talking just about what reformers did, but I'm, I'm also talking about the kind of backlash, which was what became orthodoxy. You know, what did this kind of trauma do to us as Jews and what have we lost? And you know, I'm also just thinking a lot about the kind of, you know, Christian hegemony that I grew up with in America, right? When people say to me, you know, I've recently trained to be a hospital chaplain and, you know, all my classmates are Christian, overwhelmingly Christian, even though chaplaincy is interfaith. And it was always like, oh, Sarah, tell us about your faith. It was like, my my what now? <laughs> and like, uh, are we talking about emunah? Are we talking about commandedness? You know, I was constantly translating and I realized that American society, it hands people a bunch of Christian keys, hands Jews a bunch of Christian keys and says, go try to unlock Judaism with that. And it doesn't work, right? It just doesn't work. So I'm really thinking a lot about, about a lot of these themes and how they have turned me, how they kind of turned me against Judaism and Jewish tradition and how I can reclaim this tradition and how all of us can reclaim this tradition for ourselves. Do you, do you look back and feel a sense of blame or regret, meaning how you look back at your past? I saw online uh, somebody just posted a question on on Twitter asking if you could have been born into any Jewish community. And they went through the full thing, Reconstructionist, Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, and they broke down because they're like, <laughs> they did a lot of, they went through like six different Hasidic sects. They're like, Sot love it. Bells. Yeah. And they said, like, where would you have want to have wow. been born? I personally am incredibly grateful to the community that I was born in. I wouldn't really change yeah. a thing. I'm curious for somebody like yourself. Do you feel a sense of I, I, blame is a hard word? You know, yeah, you know you're, you're, you're in your. You're yeah. in your parents' house. You love, you know, no. I, I hope that you, lo you love your parents. But is there a sense of frustration of like, wasn't it somebody's job to do a better job to tell me about this sooner? No, I really reject the blaming and the shaming and the frustration because I don't think this is something that I, I would ever pin on. Oh, Hebrew school should have been different or the rabbi should have been different or my parents should have been different. I, I really think we are all products of modernity. We are all products of this two centuries long project of Jews trying to fit into broader societies that hated them 
and that made them unsafe. And they very understandably tried to make themselves like their Christian neighbors, right? They were doing that to survive. Like no one should be blamed or shamed or judged, right? I don't, I don't judge. And and some people didn't do that. And that's great, but I don't, you know, I come from the legacy of people who did try to fit in and I don't blame them. I feel heartbroken that they had to do that. I blame the broader society that made them do that. So there's no blame or frustration or anger. I, I, I and my parents are super loving and amazing people. And, you know, were they that into Judaism? No, but they were determined to give my brother and I a sense of identity. And you know what? I'm so glad they did because I that was enough so that I could come back without feeling like a total stranger. Mm. But I wouldn't change a thing. But I, I love my life now. I love where I've gone. I have to say, I think being an outsider for so long, it gives me an ability to look at this tradition with fresh eyes and to translate it, which is very hard to do when you are deeply, deeply in it. You know, you you have so many assumptions that you don't even know that you have. So th- that's kind of my my the final point that I wanted to get to, which is like... You know, we don't proselytize in the in the Jewish community, but we do do in reach. We do try to reach mm-hmm. people who are engaged. And I could imagine, maybe not myself, because I'm so not confrontational with these things, but I could imagine, you know, whether it's a outreach rabbi or or somebody like bumping into you at you know the age of. You know, you're 35 years old and they, you know, they're they're finally got into the White House and you come in, you introduce your name, which is like the most Jewish name. <laughs> I know. One. It's like, it's like, it, it's pretty hard. Like, Hi, Sarah Hurwitz. Like, hmm, I wonder. And, <laughs> and you're like, you're in the thorough of it. You're in the thick of it. Is there anything that somebody could have said to you earlier that would have drawn you closer sooner? Uh, And is there anything that somebody could have avoided saying to you the wrong thing to say when you're reaching like you're already you're self-aware you're you're when you're in a room, you know what Kirov is or outreach is. You you know, when somebody's trying to either educate and inform or trying to, like, convince you to sign up for, I don't know, a program or whatever it is. What are the right things that somebody could have said to that Sarah Hurwitz in the past? You're in the throes of like, it's not corporate life. You're in the, the, the castle. You're in the White House right now. Like, is, is there anything that somebody could have said? And are there things that we should not have said? Yeah. So I really identify with the frustration that engaged Jews feel with disengaged Jews and almost just a sense of heartbreak where it's like, you're just throwing away, you're throwing this away. You're throwing away this 4,000 year birth rate of ours that we've fought and sacrificed so hard to keep. And so I think that sometimes comes out in anger or guilt or shaming. And I'm I'm certainly guilty of that too, right? Where it's like, how dare you? And the Holocaust and everyone's trying to kill us and this and that. And it's like, that's not a great argument, right? That's just not a great argument. You know, Judaism equals anti-Semitism plus Israel plus the Holocaust, not, not a great argument. What I would, what would have been helpful from, to say to me is I want you to show me why Judaism is a transformative, radical, countercultural, powerful tradition that is so much deeper and more powerful than the thin secular ethic of you do you as long as you don't hurt other people too much. Very low bar. The bar of American law is very low. It's don't destroy people's property or infringe on their rights or you know assault them. Very low bar. Judaism has this much low, higher bar. And I would want them to give me examples of like, okay, give me an example of a, of a high ethical bar that Judaism has. Well, how about around speech? Let's talk about gossip. Let's actually get into this and help me realize like, whoa, when I gossip, I hurt people. Not occurred to me. I also would really want them to say to me, I know that you think Judaism thinks God is a man in the sky who controls things because you've showed up twice a year at a shul, open the sitter, and that's what you think it shows. That is not true. In fact, to say something like that is basically idolatrous. We as Jews do not shrink the infinite, ineffable divine into some tiny little dogma or creed or definition that our tiny little minds can grasp, right? We have a fundamental theological humility where we don't do that because to do that is to create an idol. It's to create a human-shaped version, a human-sized version of God. You know, we don't have theology in Judaism. That's a Christian thing. What we have is commentary. We have centuries and centuries of commentators who are articulating all kinds of ideas, experiences of the divine, many of which are contradictory. And that's okay, right? Because if I had actually known that Judaism has a sophisticated, non-childish approach to the divine, to God, I mean, even these words, divine, God, these aren't Jewish words. 
These are words that I've been sort of stuck with because I grew up in a Christian society. There are endless words for God in Judaism, right? I don't even like the word God, but who knows that? How would you know that unless you've kind of grown up Jewishly engaged? So I think opening up that door saying, I know you're looking for spirituality. I know you're doing it at Buddhism and Burning Man and Soul Cycle and drugs and like, yeah, you go for it. But like, here's something deeper. Here's something smarter. That would have been very compelling to me. I really appreciate it. And it's so remarkable that you went specifically to the laws of gossip. Uh, you are not the first person to tell me that, and I'm always shocked. I- I'll tell you who the other two people are because it's so interesting. One of them was with us uh, and actually left the community that he was born up with, also a person of religious transition, and that is Shulam Dean. Uh, I-, I was one time in a... Uh, in a high school that brought in Shulam to talk to their high school students about writing, exactly what we're talking about. And he made a very similar point. He said, you should spend more time talking about the, what you could only find here. And like, we have sophisticated laws of, of, of Lush and Hara, of gossip. Like, why don't people talk about that more as like the mm-hmm. front end? And the other person I heard this from, and I almost fell out of my chair. I'm still not sure I agree with them. Uh, but, but you said the same thing is, uh, Rabbi Breitowitz from Toronto. He is a very famous, he's, he's a larger than life uh, rabbi, and I studied with him for two months. And I one time asked him, Where would you start if you were teaching somebody Judaism for the first time? Like, you, would you open up the Torah from the first page? Would you, um, I don't know, start with the beginning of the first Mishnah, Talmud, God to the Perplex? He, he banged on the table and said, I would start with the laws of Lush and Hara. I was like, What now? And it was exactly <laughs> the point. No, I thought I'm like, okay, that's crazy. So like I, I, I love it, but like I'm never actually gonna do that. But I he's making a very similar point to what you're saying in the way that we we present in writing about this and um just the the work that you have done and the example that you are uh in really living the familial component of what Yiddishkeit is all about. Uh you exude Yiddishkeit, uh which is why after all these years it's crazy we're still in touch. It's nuts. No. Can I just say that when I first met you, I thought, oh, gosh, he's going to be really judgmental of me. He's going to think I'm a bad Jew. He's like, he's orthodox. Like, And I was just struck by how open-minded you were. You know, we kind of debated, right? We actually, and maybe debate is even too strong a word. Like, we had a really spirited conversation where, yeah. I like, you were saying things, and I was like, huh, I don't know if I totally agree, but that's interesting. And I would say something, and you'd say, okay, I don't know if I totally agree, but that's interesting. And it was so thrilling. Right. That and that is so Jewish, that playfulness, that openness, that like, well, what about this bizarre scenario? What about this unusual idea? We don't have to be afraid of those things. We don't have to cancel them. We don't have to shut people down. We can actually just open heartedly have a conversation. And I just thought like, wow, what a model of what Judaism can be. Like, I just think your your open heartedness and open mindedness, it draws Jews like me in. And I think that that is just such a great model. So I, I just I appreciate that. And I think that's why we stayed friends. I think it was just that sense of mutual respect. It really means uh, means the world to me. I always conclude my interviews with more rapid fire questions. Do it. You don't have to prepare for these. Uh, my first question is I'm curious if there is you, you mentioned three already. Uh, I, I want to try to squeeze one or two more out of you, especially because this is really the month of books, books, books. We're always talking about books. I am curious for you. Are there any books that contributed to your religious or Jewish sensibilities? I'm not talking about a primer on Judaism. It could even be a, a non-Jewish book that awakened your religious sensibilities, what books would you recommend? As a Driven Leaf, that book just blew me away. It captured something. It captured that struggle between Judaism and, well, in that case, it was Greekness, Rome, but Judaism and secularism and that kind of, that struggle and just that that instinctive pullback for me, uh, very much so. I also think Dara Horn's book, People Love Dead Jews, hugely influential hugely influential to me those two particularly i really uh, appreciate both uh dara is also uh, a, a friend of the of the show somebody extraordinarily wonderful my next question if somebody gave you a great deal of money mm. and allowed you to take a sabbatical with no responsibilities whatsoever to go back to school and get a phd what do you think the subject and title of your phd would be whoa, I think I get it in Jewish studies. 
and Do you just have really a specific area. We have to drill down a little. Oh, bit. we gotta drill down. I okay, be specific. Yeah, I, can't, I can't let you off the hook of Jewish <laughs> studies. I think it would be Jewish thought, Jewish thought, and philosophy throughout the ages. Is there a specific uh, uh, phil- philosopher that has drawn you in? Again, uh, you 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 have like a Maimonidian component to you. Yeah, um, I'm not. I, I I appreciate some of what he said. He's, he, Maimonides is not really resonate with me I, there's a lot I, that's not where you would go no where would no. you go i'm just curious i probably look actually i think hasidism a lot of the it's funny when you said like oh you're not hasidish it's like well actually that spiritually is probably what most draws me in i don't want to wear a rainbow tallis or a big purple <laughs> you know keep up but like that <laughs> i really yeah I'm, i've been very moved by hasidic writings that i've read so i would probably drill down there that is absolutely beautiful that is the i didn't get my phd in hasidus but i did do my master's <laughs> Uh, okay. And uh, there's a lot, a lot to unroll there. My final question: I'm always curious about people's sleep schedules. What time do you go to sleep at night, and what time do you wake up in the morning? So I usually, you know, at 11 p.m. I I start to wind down. That's me, and I always read just a very. I, I do not read like when I I'm reading kind of you know, I'm slogging through pretty dense Jewish stuff all day. And so at night, I just want something that is like a massage for my brain. So I actually read detective novels, like murder mystery detective novels, and not even not like really super literary ones, like middle brow, simple sentences, detective (laughs) novels, whodunit. And then I try to be, I try to fall asleep by like midnight, 1230. And I generally get up around like 738. So I'm I'm a big fan of the seven to eight hours of sleep at night. And I yes. have the luxury of getting that because I don't have little kids. I mean, most people who are parents do not have that luxury. So I, I don't take it for granted at all. Sarah Hurwitz, what an absolute privilege and pleasure to speak with you today. I hope that the next time we speak, it is in person. We have a, a reunion of sorts, but I really cannot thank you enough for taking the time to speak with us today. Oh, it is a total pleasure. And I, too, hope the next time that we speak is in person. So great to see you. Alex and Sarah, uh, in my mind, in my estimation, are both uh, two shining uh, neon entrance signs into Jewish life and Jewish engagement. And whether it's for you or somebody you know or somebody you love or somebody you're just acquainted with, uh, knowing the full gamut of our neon entrance signs is something that can be very, very helpful in bringing that pride and that connection to Jewish life uh, really to the masses and the work that they've done in that regard is so uplifting and nourishing. I am so grateful to to both of them. I want to end because I mentioned him in the beginning, and it's somebody who I think as a community, we need people who have been created in this model. I want to end with a quote, uh, again, from Herman Wouk. This is from his book, This Is My God. And he writes as follows. It's It's kind of very moving. And if you don't own a copy, you've never read a copy, uh, get a copy because this book needs to be remembered and preserved. And what he represented, though he may not be famous in 2023 like he was in the 1950s, uh, so much of what he writes about and the way he writes about Judaism uh, really resonates through the generations that deserves to be a classic. And this is what he writes. To sum up then, we are Israelites descended from the small nation which came out of the Sinai desert into Canaan 3,000 years ago, with a tradition of liberation from Egypt under a lawgiver and deliverer named Moses. We are called Jews in our heritage Judaism because in the political decline and fall of our nation, the tribe which held out longest and became the surviving remnant in exile predicted by the Torah was named Judah. Almost all living Jews stem at a remove of no more than four or five generations at most from observant Jews. Historically, Israelites who have discontinued the practice of the law of Moses have faded into the environment and lost their identity within a century or two. The attrition over the centuries has, of course, been enormous. The Jews who are left are mainly the sons and grandsons of those who kept the faith, preserving the chain unbroken through time from the 20th century back to the sunrise of the human intelligence. Before examining this faith, we can surely acknowledge two things. First, that as a feat of gallantry of the spirit of man, the preservation of Judaism ranks high. Second, that if ancient lineage be a source of legitimate pride, the Jews have a right to be a proud people. And that is a moving note 
uh, to conclude this episode and really show appreciation for all those, not just our guests uh, who we spoke with today, Alex and Sarah, but all those who serve as reminders, most of our listeners, I'm sure, in one way or another, who are able to cultivate that sense of pride in Jewish identity, in who we are, and continuing that chain unbroken through time from the 20th century back to the sunrise of the human intelligence in the words of human wook, and creating that neon entry sign for all those who may be on the periphery or even further out to find ways to re-engage, continue to engage, and continue and rebuild a new chain to continue on for generations. So thank you so much for listening, especially to this double header episode. This episode was edited by our stand-in friend and editor, Rob Pira, our normal editor, Dina Emerson. We're wishing her a lot of joy on her summer vacation. Dina, don't lose our number. Stay in touch. It wouldn't be a Jewish podcast without a little bit of Jewish guilt. So if you enjoyed this episode or any of our episodes, please subscribe, rate, review, tell your friends about it. You can also donate at 1840.org slash donate. Thank you again to our sponsors, our episode sponsors at twillery.com. You can use the coupon code 1840. That's the numbers one eight followed by the word F O R T Y. Again, you get money off for all orders over $139. New customers only. I believe it expires at the end of July 2023. And thank you, of course, to our series sponsor, who really is helping us with all of our book content and culture, uh, an old friend who chooses to remain anonymous. If you'd like to learn more about this topic or some of the other great ones we've covered in the past, be sure to check out 1840.org. That's the number 18, followed by the word 40, F-O-R-T-Y.org, where you can also find videos, articles, recommended readings, and weekly emails. Thank you so much for listening, and stay curious, my friends.